Welcome everyone to Beyond's webinar, Overcoming Barriers to Scaling Up Your Business. I'm Lori Wiggins, CEO of Beyond. And presenting with me today is Hector Del Castillo, Chief Product Officer at Beyond. Hector, how are you today? Doing great, Lori. It's a pleasure to be here. Looking forward to our discussion. As am I. Before we get started, let's go through a couple of housekeeping rules. First, all attendees are in listen-only mode in order to ensure the best audio quality for everyone. If you have any audio issues, restart your browser and check your audio settings. Submit your questions anytime through the chat window and we'll address them during the discussion or afterwards during the Q&A portion. We're recording today's session and we will share a link to the video with you after the live session. If you want to get in touch with us or keep up with us, we're on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, on Twitter, please see us at, at BeyondMA, at Lori J. Wiggins, and at HM Del Castillo. On LinkedIn, you can keep up with us at bit.ly slash beyond MNA. Lastly, special thanks to Scott Taylor, who does all of our video editing and production. Finally, at Beyond, we believe in making a positive, massive positive impact to any organization we work with we work with software and technology companies to help them scale, buy, sell, and obtain investment. Take it away, Hector. Well, thank you so much, Laurie, and hello, everyone. First of all, we want to talk about some barriers to scale your business. And that's what we're going to spend the, the majority of our time. We're going to go through all of these today in more detail. But before we get started, I actually want to ask you and do a poll. And I'm actually launching the poll right now. So we, if you can take a minute and answer this question, what are your plans for this, for this year? Are you looking to scale your business? Are you looking to acquire another business? Or are you looking to exit or are you looking to grow your business are you looking to just maintain your current business because right now you're just want to keep it running smoothly smoothly these are the five different choices if you can choose the best one that applies to you would be great and then we can proceed on to discuss more about each one of these barriers so we'll give you a few seconds in order for to allow everyone to contribute as we are proceeding on. And just to suffice that there is a difference between scaling a business and growing a business. And we talked about that before. We actually have uh, some short videos that we have done in the, in the past few weeks uh, explaining the difference between growing a business and scaling a business. Today's discussion is gonna be focused on specifically scaling up your business and what you need to do and what are some of these common barriers and challenges that present themselves in different ways so we're going to be uh, discussing that further and i see many of you have actually responded so uh, to let you know that i'm going to I'm now going to be closing the poll and allowing information but there's a few of you that have selected that you're currently looking to scale your business uh, whereas some of you are looking to grow your business in 2021 and there are uh, a few of you that are looking to uh, do other things instead, but we're basically just looking at um, presenting and, and going back um, and showing some of these things. So let's discuss, so I'm going to just go through some of the things that we're going to be discussing today, some of these barriers, and then quickly uh, move on to expanding on to the next, uh, some, some of these points that we're going to be making in, in, in a deeper way. So the first one is paying for numbers and not quality. We're gonna expand on this a little bit more, but often this is something that we find most executives don't really know how to actually focus on understanding what is the right quality and where to actually raise your increase of quality rather than quantity. 
insufficient funding or lack to access to financial instruments to actually fund the scaling of your business. Number three, no growth for learning, no budget for learning, meaning that you actually spend all your money and you run out and you're not necessarily looking for um, anticipating some of the things that you should be expecting will are most likely to happen and that therefore you will need to actually invest a, a little bit more either in the people or the tools or any combination of those things to actually get you to where you want to be. Number four, focusing on the wrong metrics. Often we find that you're focused on the wrong metrics and you need to figure out figuring out what are the right metrics to be measuring success. And number five, adding unnecessary features to your product or your product line. And that's what we find often will also increase complexity and that will usually means higher cost, which prevents you from being able to be in a great position to scale the business. And before we go any further, I wanna actually launch a second poll and, and um, let you know this second question that we're actually launching is about which of these obstacles have you encountered? So out of the five, and you may have, there may be more. So I'm actually going to be launching this poll. Select any of these that apply. Are, are you facing lack of access to funding? Are you seeing lack of access to the right people, the right tools? Uh, not sure how to measure success is one of your problems, or you can't prioritize because you got too many customer requests that are not necessarily converging, they're diverging from each other. Select any of these that apply, by the way, because you may be encountering not just one, but multiple barriers. So just let us know which ones of these you're actually seeing most often. Uh, you can't keep up with, with requests. Uh, you are seeing unanticipated supply chain disruptions, or you don't have access to the right distribution channels that you would like to use for your to sell more of your product or get you know acquire more customers or are you unable to anticipate some of these setbacks that have happened in the last 18 months or so any of these you you can pick and we can actually uh, go through and and look at so we'll give you a few more seconds to respond before we proceed and we will share how any of these actually connect to any of these five barriers that we're going to be discussing further today so i see that many of you have responded so we'll give you a few more seconds to respond and then we can actually take a look at the results and take a look at what uh, everybody has said but i'm seeing this actually lighting up almost every every uh choice that we have here has been selected by someone and so let's take take a look at, at what this is and i'm actually going to be showing sharing the results here are the results so you can see that the top ones are the, the, the lack of quality um, in, in the way that you quality leads that you're up for your prospects, your customers, target customers, and not really sure how to measure success. So we're going to be discussing these two definitely for much, much more along with the other ones and connecting them. So we will um, actually I will stop sharing results and then now I will uh, be able to continue on with our discussion. And why don't we move to the next slide? So I'm going to be discussing now why paying for numbers is is uh, actually one of the things that is an uh, often encountered barrier. Now, paying for numbers, not quality. When it comes to leads and it comes to making sure that you have targeted leads, you want to focus on quantity. And by the mean by that is that not only do you have to know that demographically you are actually have the right leads in your pipeline, um, you, either your CRM is growing with leads and now you're tracking them in a four or five stage marketing and sales funnel. And maybe you have also a sales pipeline that you're tracking and you wanna make sure that you have lots of prospects up top of funnel all the way down to people evaluating alternatives so that they can actually start making a decision and lead to a conversion. And hopefully that whole process will be co more conversions for you over time. But lacking quality means that you actually are delaying your revenue because now your average order size may be the same, but the time to close your sales cycle, it becomes longer if the, the, the less quality in those leads that you start with. So moving on to 
where the majority of, of, of your issue is, is that your cost of acquiring customers, and that's what you need to do, not only are you looking to retain current customers, but you're looking to acquire much more, 20, 30 times more customers without, while well, maintaining your cost structures for pretty much reasonable, just, you know, cost reduce, be able to still deliver the value, but be able to grow your customer base to 20, 30 times where you are today. The issue is the cost of acquisition usually is much higher than whatever customer lifetime value those customers, those new customers represent. And usually this is the case for most organizations as they're trying to pursue a, a different segment that they don't have currently that they haven't bought from them in the past, or you're entering a new market and now they have slightly different behavior and you need to all of those things are, are, are sort of like things that will actually increase your customer acquisition costs. Well, what you wanna do is you wanna over time, make sure you turn that around where your customer acquisition costs go down over time. And now you're focusing on increasing your average order size while you're still maintaining your sales cycle goes down as much as possible. Make it very easy, make it a frictionless customer experience for people to look identify evaluate and then buy in your favor make that buy decision in your favor so over time you're looking at not just uh, maintaining that cost uh, acquisition cost down while you're keeping your lifetime value for your customers high you're also trying to shorten your average sales cycle as well and once you do this you know there's a, a study that shows that once you start looking at your cost of acquisitions and your ratio of the customer acquisition cost to the customer lifetime value, you've got to get that where your customer lifetime value is at least twice as high as your customer acquisition costs. What we find is that most people, number one, have a hard time measuring customer lifetime value and customer acquisition costs. They're not tracking those in, in, in figuring out and therefore, they're not even looking at that ratio to see whether the ratio is in your favor or against you and figure out how to do this. Here's what's happening today, right? Gardner is saying that if you're looking at increasing the quality of your leads, it's not just about demographics, it's about psychographic behavior, understanding buyer behavior. And now what the biggest thing that most everybody has moved to in the last 18 months, and according to Gardner and Demand Gen, Organizations are predicting that more and more B2B vendors will be using what they call buy intent data, meaning it's not just demographically the right contact information for the, your targets, but you're also knowing ahead of time before you even approach them that they're looking for evaluate to, uh, to actually identify and discover solutions to their problems. And those solutions can be through your products that you're selling, whatever you're offering. And this is going to be sustaining for the next five years. There's a lot of growth in B2B vendors adopting access to databases that contain by intent information, meaning you already know ahead of time what those target leads are looking to buy in the next few weeks or the next few days, depending on how long your sales cycle is. And therefore, uh, moving on to the next point about quality, you want to focus on the uh, information that is on the on the next slide, which is the actual information that is about five different ways that buy intent data can actually help you because not only can you identify the right potential buyers at the right time, it can help you increase the conversion rate because you know that they're only a few weeks or a few days away from making, from evaluating and before they make a, a buy decision. And uh, you can actually figure out by providing the right content, the right information at the right time and have a frictionless sales process, marketing and sales process that you're actually also reducing the average time, cycle time of closing a deal. And you enable, you empower your marketing and sales teams to become more effective by being able to increase 
the quality of your leads, of your lead information by using by intent data. And there are lots of vendors that are springing up right now. You, you, there's a whole host of them that have this information available. You just have to find it and ask for it. Because if today you're using a legacy way of acquiring leads that doesn't contain this information, you're losing out and competitors, if they're adopting this faster than you, you may be losing some of these leads to your competitors instead. So I would say you need to focus on increasing the quality of your leads by including by intent information as you're actually targeting them with content. Approach them at the right time. The next point Lori will make, which will get into point number two, but before I do that, I talk about a company that is right now just been scaling it. And in the last 18 months, they've been growing even more. ServiceNow. ServiceNow is a provider of IT workflows for software publishers and everyone, any vendor that is now creating a mobile application for to actually grow product adoption. So major brands that are hiring somebody else to actually keep up their, their mobile applications and web applications to actually e increase more online selling, ServiceNow is the number one provider of those workflows that can actually very quickly create a scalable architecture of, the, of ways of deploying mobile applications and upgrading them. And those mobile applications will actually have buy transactions. They're able to have shopping carts and, and enable more, more uh, sales online via mobile devices or any device that you carry. And, and these are for online sales. And that's why you've seen a huge rise in online sales from last year, post, you know, post COVID-19, everybody has now gone into having ways of selling online where an online is not just using your computer or laptop and the internet, you're also using any mobile device that you're carrying on your hand from anywhere. Make it a, making it a frictionless buy, buy, uh, buying experience is what most vendors are doing. And service, ServiceNow is an organization that is enabling that. And this is why you've seen this huge growth rate in, in the way they've been scaling their business. And right now, their valuation has gone high. Today, ServiceNow is, is on Forbes list of one of the most innovative companies in the world. So next point, Lori will be making. Thanks, Hector. Next, we're gonna talk about insufficient funding for scaling. I wanna preface this part of the discussion with the fact that we're talking about companies here that are ready to scale. They have shown and proven their product market fit. They have consistent revenue and they're profitable. There is such a thing as scaling too quickly for a company, but that's not what we're talking about here. If you have insufficient monies in order to fund your scaling, instead of growing at 5x, 10x, 20x faster than your costs, you end up falling back into a growth scenario where your costs are rising at a rate much closer to your revenue increase, not what you had in mind. This can create problems for you because if your competition is scaling and you're not, it could cause you to lose market momentum and uh, it could cause your growth to decline or fall off dramatically. Also, it can be frustrating if you have scaling goals and you're not meeting them. Now, there are lots of ways to raise money and these topics are the source of another talk or 10. But I want to talk about the lowest hanging fruit of all, and that is optimizing your cash flow. That's the most ready source of funding, at least partially, for your scaling that you have available to you. It is the easiest and fastest way to make a dent in that insufficient funding problem. 
I'm talking about tracking how your cash is going in and out, what's coming in, who owes you, and getting that money as quickly as possible. For example, if you have an online subscription um, associated with your platform, then can you provide a discount to your customers to pay for their subscription up front instead of by the month so that you can get that money faster? Also, keeping track of what you owe others better. Landlords, suppliers, your employees, and um, making sure that you pay them on time. My father had an electronic parts distribution business for over 40 years. His suppliers were manufacturers and frequently they would provide discounts if you paid them early. So the 1%, the 2%, the 5% discount that he got off his invoices added up. And that can really contribute to your cash reserves. This is all about keeping more of the cash that flows through your business. We were working with a client and they have a service business and they did a lot of things right in their business as they wanted us to help them acquire another company. So as part of the information they provided us, we were looking at their financials and under their expenses, we saw this very large expense, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in short-term business loan interest. We found out that in order to get a Fortune 500 company as their customer, they had to sign up to a net 90-day um, payment schedule. Keep in mind, our clients, uh, people they owed were on net 30 and net 45. So they were paying the carrying costs of this Fortune 500 customer. Well, our client's customer loved them. They were doing and are doing a great job for them. So we said, hey, you got to get this under control. Go back to your customer and ask for a 30 day net. And if you have to go to 45 day, but no further than that. Well, they did. They were able to renegotiate that term and largely wipe out that short term interest expense. This is what I'm talking about, where you're paying more attention about what's coming in and what's going out. So the bottom line here is using as much internal funding as you can due to your wise cash management. Now you don't have to go out and get so much money and the money that you get, you will manage more wisely because you do a good job with your own cash flow. This can really goose your scaling efforts. Back to you, Hector. Hector, you're on mute. Thank you. Point number three, no budget for learning. Well, what do we mean by no budget for learning? Often we, we know that anything that if you actually did the poll and your response was to that you aren't able to anticipate or there's too much uncertainty, ambiguity, maybe even volatility in the market that you've seen in the last 18 months or so, how it's not so easy to grow when you are in the middle of all this and most of the time your revenue may be going up and down. So if we go to some of the best practices as to what people do to actually overcome this is, number one, you want to actually start looking at that, number one, you want to be able to anticipate or expect setbacks. Whenever there's going to be too much uncertainty, ambiguity, you can, it's hard to anticipate what's going to be happening or what's most likely to happen next. So you've got to account and budget for setbacks. And what we mean by that in order to do that is that not only do you maybe expect delays 
but often those delays because you still have to uh, be able to uh, pay wages and maybe even turn on new tools that you did not expect all of these things can be additional cost structures and you want to make sure that upfront whatever money you have to spend once you have optimized your cash flow as uh, Lori pointed out earlier you also want to allocate your budget and always leave somewhere between 15 to 20 percent of whatever money you have to spend over that time period that you are projecting or forecasting and release your budget based on milestones or targets that you have agreed upon upfront with your teams. And many of these milestones are not just about product development. There may be about customer acquisition or maybe turning on a new distribution channel or maybe even identifying a new supplier because there's been some sort of disruption and you need to now look for suitable suppliers very quickly. Those are all things that may be part of this contingency in, the, in your allocation to ensure that you're allocating a buffer for learning, meaning some of these things that you might happen, you might need to allocate time and budget to be able to execute on that. And the fourth thing would be to also encourage your workers to continue upskilling themselves, because especially if you're in a technology or software company, you know that there's gonna be new technologies and a new technologies are being created more and more quickly. And that trend is going to be maintained. It's actually accelerating right now. New innovations, new technologies are being developed faster than ever in history of humankind. You need to encourage your workers to continue to keep up with those new technologies. And the fourth thing in the next slide you can actually accomplish because companies like Google, like Microsoft and Cisco will always create a stipend for their workers so they actually can spend in however they want to upskill themselves. And a recent report says, here are the, the ways that you can future-proof your business by encouraging your workers, your employees to upskill themselves. Now that we've been thrown out into this remote working world, most experts are saying that hybrid business is what's going to remain in the next five, 10 years. More and more of us are going to be working from a home office or a remote office, even though we still are maintaining our full-time jobs. And therefore, there's a new set of skills that are needed when most of your workers are now going to be remote or working in, in areas where they're not physically located next to each other like they were before 2020. So more leadership is needed, more critical thinking, more project management skills, being able to be adaptable because you've got to have workers that don't are, are against change. They have to embrace change or be agents of change because change is what's needed to overcome any barriers that we are talking about here. Increase of their digital skills and also more empathy as well. These are the skill sets that a recent reporter saying are the focus of any organization because upskilling the workers in these areas will actually make your business more future proof. And that is what you want to do. These four things that I mentioned about, the fourth thing is to make sure that you at least have a stipend. And a stipend usually would be on the order of $2,000 to maybe $3,000 a year per employee where they have the option to sign up for any kind of online learning uh, courses that can allow them to actually upskill themselves in any of these areas. And companies like Cisco, for example, they have their own university. So does Google and other technology companies do this typically where they uh, make, make it very easy for their employees to pick whatever it is that they want to sign up for and make it part of their learning and development plan that they will deploy for the rest of the year to continuously continue to upskill themselves in the right areas that they, are, they recognize they most need. And moving on to a case study of a company that has done this specifically and actually has made this even further, made that part of their purpose. Not only do they encourage their employees to upskill themselves, but they also encourage their employees to actually get involved in improving their local communities. So Salesforce has been one of these companies that has been effectively scaling. If you look at the track record from 1998 when they were started, you know, within two years they were at 40 employees. And then very quickly, uh, a couple of years later, 
they went public and they have remained going up in valuation this entire time. And even today, they have made some uh, recent large acquisitions that are in the billions of dollars, all because their market cap has been nothing but skyrocketing at double digit growth rate year after year. And it is because they have actually focused on becoming a purpose driven organization where they will encourage their employees to volunteer so many hours a year and they will actually give them paid time off to volunteer in worthwhile activities that are for improving their local communities and they do this year after year i think they allocate something like a few hundreds a few hundred hours per employee where they have the option of getting paid for actually volunteering to do work with nonprofit organizations or other organizations that are about being change makers within their own local communities. And this is work for Salesforce because they're still continuing. Their cap rate is still going up even post pandemic. They, they have not been impacted at all. They've been, they, the pandemic did not slow them down. They actually continue to maintain the, the way their growth rate in their market cap. Lori, back to you. Thank you, Hector. Let's talk about focusing on the wrong metrics. What I'm talking about here are quote unquote vanity metrics. Number of Twitter followers or number of likes or reposts of your LinkedIn post. While this is a, an indicator of company, your company visibility to others, quick, can you say if you get X amount number of Twitter followers in a given period of time, how that's going to produce Y additional dollars of revenue for you? I'm not saying that these things don't have value because they do, but it's indirect. I'm suggesting that perhaps you focus on other metrics that more directly uh, impact your company goals and specifically your revenue. Things like customer lifetime value. Now, uh, customer lifetime value is the total revenue that that customer brings in divided by the customer acquisition costs. Ideally, the revenue that a customer brings in is at least twice, if not greater, than the cost to acquire that customer. Total revenue is another important metric per month, per quarter, per year. Net profit, average order size per customer. Number of transactions over a period of time, again, per month, per quarter, per year. And customer retention. Another uh, important set of metrics to look at are those that measure your customer buying process. Now, this varies depending on whether you're talking about digital or other kinds of sales, but um, the entrance metric, how many people are touching you for the first time, whether that's getting uh, going to your website, or they've received an email from you versus those that convert. In other words, becoming buying customers. And conversions, the conversion metric gets broken down depending on what industry you're in into smaller segments. Like for example, um, this could be webinar attendance. It could be downloads or signing up for an e your email or your newsletter. Um, and especially if they are requesting a quote, either directly or online. And now you see how it ties into two metrics that we previously discussed, which is total revenue and average order size. McKinsey did performed a study of those that scale and a common trait among the high performers was that 
they had identified one star metric, one metric that encapsulated their success or lack of it. For Facebook, they knew they could reach a billion followers if they could have seven friends convert within 10 days. For Slack, their star metric was 2,000 conversations within the team. If they could achieve that, they knew they would have that customer for the long term. For your company, what is your star metric? Identify it, focus on it, and grow it. And point number five is adding unnecessary features. What you want to do is you want to have clarity of how it is that your team is going to prioritize when you have lots of people asking you for different things and they're not necessarily converging requests, especially when you have diverging requests from multiple customers, not just key accounts, but even new customers and trying to capture them. Often it's a struggle is where I find most technology and software companies that once they actually are what's preventing them from actually scaling and acquiring customers is the fact that they can't keep up with all the different customer requests that they have from current customers. And therefore, they're never able to actually acquire new customers because they are confused as to what's the number one, who, who's number one, current customers or possible new customers. And is there a connection or trying to figure out what is the right problem to be solving before they actually commit new functionality? And often what you find is that as you're adding more functionality, then a product that used to be useful is no longer useful, like this largest Swiss army knife that is shown here. And there's other things about this. So we're gonna talk about one tenet that you want to make sure you never violate, and that is keep your product line or your offering simple. Work on the KISS principle. You keep your offering simple. And because um, number one, adding new functionality means you add complexity. And there are definitely geometrically rising hidden costs. The more complexity, the more hidden costs rise simply because you need more people maybe different skill sets to do things that are needed to not only implement the new fun functionality that you that is being requested, but then maintaining it, supporting it, doing things like installations and updates and upgrades and all these things that you need to worry about in making sure that you're distributing those updates that you're doing to your offering and then figuring out how to price it right as well as you're adding more and more functionality that not necessarily everybody uses and then be able to track to see to really test you know we built it but are people really using it you wouldn't you would be amazed as all the different software vendors that i've been involved with discussions knowing that they've been working on adding and adding and adding more functionality because that's easy to do especially when you have an agile development process for new features where when you look at how many actual customers are using all those new features that are being introduced over time and you find that out of the entire functionality only about 10 percent or less of the total functionality they've ad added over time is actually being used by the majority of their customers so my point is why are you doing it just because you can doesn't mean you should and if you're not looking at actually understanding and identifying and managing the hidden cost of adding more complexity to your product, you, you are already fighting a losing battle to begin with because you need to stop that very quickly. Avoid complexity at all costs and design your offering for simplicity. And often when you're done doing that, you're doing upfront a lot of design thinking. You're not building, you're designing, architecting making sure that whatever you end up with is scalable, easily scalable and frictionless to customers and very easy for your customers to understand the unique value proposition if you were to build that. Do that number one, 
figuring out how to do that and maintain it and support it before you begin building that. And you can do this by simply using agile design thinking processes in place before you begin building. Make sure you test your concepts in front of prospective customers before you commit anything to development because you already know up front that adding more complexity to your product is the wrong thing to do because that will increase your operational cost, bar none. An example of a company that has done exactly that and actually very quickly scaled because Zoom communications is the killer application of 2020. It was bar none, the most downloaded mobile application in the world. And look at what their market cap did in April of 2020. And if you look and you follow, because Zoom is a publicly tracked company, if you look at SEC charts of what they've done in 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 2020 up until now april 20 2020 they were rising they did not peak until october of last year and they have gone down slightly in the early part of 2021 but they're still a much higher valuation than any of the airlines that you see here and this is a perfect example of product-led growth they stuck to what they knew they, they were. Actually, the CEO was formerly an employee of WebEx, one of their leading competitors, and WebEx has not scaled. It is Zoom that has scaled compared to any other video conferencing application. And this is a perfect example of keeping your offering simple. And yes, there were some things that were found in 2020, but pretty for the most part, Anyone that is a Zoom user, they know that they have to address the issue that they that they had or they found out about in 2020. And now they actually updated their application to actually make it much more reliable and secure. And that's uh, the story of Zoom is a result is that effectively their market cap just went skyrocketed even in uh, uh, 2020 when most other companies were struggling because of all, all those things that we talked about earlier happened because of uh, COVID-19. Laurie, back to you. Thank you, Hector. So let's recap. First, we went through paying for numbers, not quality, insufficient funding, no budget for learning, focusing on the wrong metrics, and adding unnecessary features. So here's some quick takeaways. When we do these webinars, we always like to provide our audience, <clears throat> excuse me, with immediately actionable points. And the first one is that um, uh, customer quality trumps customer quantity. Sufficient scaling funds start with good cash flow management internally. Include 10 to 20% of your scaling budget for learning. Identify your star metric, focus on it and grow it. Keep your offering simple and execute. So let's go to Q&A. And Hector has another poll for us because we have a question for you. Yes, yeah, so um, if you are in the audience, if you can actually type in any questions you might have on the on the chat, we will be monitoring the chat uh, and uh, asking uh, and actually waiting for any questions you might have. But as we get uh, as you type in, I would like to ask if you could actually uh, answer this particular poll. One of the activities that we're doing, and we'll be announcing that, is we're actually planning a panel discussion that we're doing in June uh, next month and would like to ask if you are if you're a ceo of a company that has been effectively and successfully scaling your business we'd like to know if you're interested in being a guest panelist at our next month's panel discussion we're looking for three ceos of mid-market technology software companies that have successfully been scaling meaning you've been seeing a growth rate of 30% year to year for the last three years or so, and increasing not just the number of customers, but also maintaining your operational cost down because you built the right platform that has been scalable from the beginning. If you're that type of business, 
we would like to ask if you're interested and let us know if you're interested in being a panelist at a future panel discussion. We're looking at maybe this being the first of maybe a series of panels where we're asking CEOs that we know um, that if they want to actually be guest panelists for upcoming panel discussions. The, the one that we're doing next month will be strictly online. Um, and we're looking for at least three CEOs that are willing to share their experience in what, what barriers they encounter and how they overcame those barriers. All those things is what we're looking at doing. So if you can uh, respond to this panel, uh, to this uh, particular poll will be great. And we can reach out to you offline. Um, by the way, we make it easy. Uh, questions are agreed to ahead of time. So you know what questions are coming and you can think about your answers before the webinar. And it really just becomes a very enjoyable discussion. So if you yourself are interested in doing that or you care to mention it to the CEO of your company, if you're not the CEO and you're attending today, that would be appreciated. And I'm monitoring the chat and I don't see any, any questions yet on the chat. So audience, just if you can have any questions for us, let us know. And it could be about anything that we discuss, or it could be about something else. Maybe you're struggling with a different barrier. Uh, one of the ones that I mentioned in the poll earlier, if you feel that we did not discuss adequately your the barriers that you've encountered as you're trying to either grow or scale your business just typing into the chat we'll be more than glad to at least give you what what we know uh, between Lori and I on that uh, Hector I actually have an audience question that I received via email and that is um, uh, the intent data and um, what is the basis for that? Can you explain how that's generated? Yes. So by intent data is sort of like the um, opposite of doing search engine optimization for your website or your mobile applications, for example, right? Uh, if you're familiar with SEO, you basically now, the, the typical way of doing this is that you're actually looking, you're expecting that people are searching, you know, because they're actually using some sort of search box when they're looking for alternatives or even discover the right solution for the problem they have. Mm -hmm. And they're constantly typing in queries and queries have keywords. And if you know what their people are typing in when they're doing the searches or during discovery phase, of whatever, uh, of actually at least identifying alternatives before they begin evaluating. That's when you want to uh, look at, you know, drive them over to your website or to your mobile application, for as an example, right? Mm -hmm. By intent data uses the same technologies. So this is basically grooming all those queries that people are doing as they're logging into the internet with their favorite device and typing in searches for specific type of solutions or answers to specific problems that they're looking to solve and, and look for the right tools or the right products that will solve their problem. The intent data providers will actually take all that information and they will say, you know, what is their by intent, right? So there's a lot of automatic information that is generated that is firsthand from people typing in queries and as opposed to giving you keywords, they're actually now saying, here's the things that are most sought. You know, who's looking for more Juniper networking equipment or who's looking for more, um, you know, applications for Oracle database or a no, no SQL database. These are all things that, you know, usually there are vendors behind. These are usually B2B vendors. And that information is then put in a data lake so that now they're saying, what company is this company? is this person with? What is their job title? What is their role, their job title within the company? And are they an influencer? Are they a buyer, meaning a, a decision maker? Or are they a user? And they can give you that information upfront. So not a, when you're a B2B vendor, and you know that you have to hit not just the decision makers, but also the influencers, in addition to the users, because those are different people within the same organization. And that's what you need to do when you market you know that you need to present to the influencers and 
the decision maker at the right time. And you need to keep track of that when you're selling B2B products, because the, what users are looking for are slightly different than what influencers of, uh, of that decision compared to the decision maker. And all of that is put together for you. You can identify the companies that are looking for something that you have to offer, but also the job titles and the people. And that is all the information that you need to bring into your marketing and sales database. So you can actually present the right content at the right time based on where in the buying process they are in. And because you know that there's an expiration date, because usually it just goes along with a normal sales cycle. And that sales cycle can vary from months to a few weeks or days, depending on the type of offering you have. Some of this is usually the things that you need to constantly be acquiring because this is about this is not not about you saying we have the right targets in our CRM. This is about asking which of the contacts in our CRM are ready to buy right now or are about to look for a new alternative right now and making sure that you're distributing information to them, make it very easy for them to ask for a demo, be able to get information, find it, educate them a little bit about what they need to do next in order for them to actually get what they're looking for as far as game creators. And all of that can be simple uh, content that you are distributing at the, at the right time once you understand where they are in, in the buy process. So it's about understanding psychographic behavior targets and psychographics trumps demographics. Thank you, Hector. And here is the aforementioned event that we're gonna have on Wednesday, June the 23rd. We almost always have our webinars on the fourth Wednesday of the month. So if you can be a speaker or you know someone who can, please contact us. Thank you. We, all, we hope to see all of you there next month. So, if you are scaling, you're thinking about scaling, or you might start to be considering thinking about scaling, or you have other issues in your business, please don't hesitate to reach out when you're ready. We'll be happy to talk to you about your business or any aspect of this or other topics we present and how we can help. Solutions at beyondma.com. Finally, here's how to contact both Hector and myself. Thank you for joining us today and have a great day.